Warm greetings to all viewers of this uh, program, uh, which is intended to explain some of the simple methods of counting. Counting is a extremely important um, facility to have for mathematics students because in many instances counting is necessary or knowing how to count is very necessary uh, in solving certain problems uh, especially in subjects like combinatorics um, probability and even in statistics so we are going to just give a very elementary introduction in the counting certain types of counting in certain types of situations all right so let's now begin with a simple problem Okay, so the question is, first question is, how many terms are there in the sequence from the list of sequence there, uh, starting from six and going through the counting numbers, six, seven, eight, nine, all the way to, up to 85. All right, our first guess will be 85 minus six. Right? Uh, saying that the the number is 79. So that will be the first guess. Let's see whether this is in fact true. Okay, so when you think about it if you want to really count this what you have to do is to add the remaining numbers from 1 to 6 in other words we'll add the numbers from 1 2 3 4 up to 5 so let's do that 1 2 3 And then we go back to what we have. All the way up to 85. Now, it's quite clear that the number of numbers in this entire sequence is 85. And we've added only five numbers to the original. So therefore the number of terms here must have been 80. Right? Which is different from 79. You see? So our first guess is wrong. In fact, what we should have done is you could have sub subtracted 85 minus 6 that gives 79 but add 1 to it. And that will give you the correct answer. Okay? All right, let's get on to the next problem. Let's get on to the next problem. How many terms are there in the arithmetic sequence? A, 
A plus D all the way up to L. Now, some of you might be familiar with this. What's really happening here is that this is a sequence we are written. In. We wrote it in, in a very general form where it starts with a number and then you add a fixed number D to it to get the next term. And the next one is where you're adding D again to this thing to get to that. And you keep adding D until you come to the last term. We, we use the symbol L for the last term. Now the question is how many terms are there in this in the sequence? Right? And I suggest to you that the answer is got a very nice simple formula and that is you take the last term L you subtract from it the first term L minus A and divide by what you are adding all the time this fixed what, what we call difference. This is the difference between two consecutive terms, you'll notice, is D. If I take the difference between these two, it will also be D. So, this is a common difference. If you, do, you divide the difference between the last term and the first term by the common difference, add one to it. And that will give you the answer. You might ask, where, where did this formula come from? Well, if you go to school mathematics, it says that the last term, there's a formula for it, last term is given by formula A plus N minus 1 times D. Now, the question is, how many terms are there? So that's the question. So the question is, what is the value of n, the number of terms? The symbol n is used for the number of terms in any sequence. Right? So if the, the number of terms in the sequence is n, then the formula says that the last term is obtained from the first term and the common difference by this formula and notice that we need to find n here so we need to make this the subject of the formula so we subtract a on both sides so to make it the subject of the formula we have to divide on both sides by d to get to n minus 1 and then n itself, that's what we're looking for, is L minus A over D plus 1, to bring one to the other side. And that's exactly what we've got there. So that's a very neat formula. Now let's see uh, If you can use this, if you can use this formula in another situation, let's try this problem here. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm struggling with this thing. So suppose we try this formula on this sequence here. By the way, this such a sequence is called an arithmetic sequence where you are adding a fixed number to each term to get the next one. Like, like here, you see you're adding 8 to get to 45, you're adding 8 to get to 53, and we are told that this is an arithmetic sequence. So it means that this pattern continues like this. Now you want to know how many terms there are here. In this example, you see that your A, your first term, is 37 first term your a is 37 your d is what you're adding all the time you're adding 8 and your last term is 677 so therefore the number of terms that's a symbol for number number of terms 
terms is equal to what did we say? It's L minus A over D plus 1. And your L we saw was 677. Your A is 37. Dividing by D, which is 8. Sorry, 8. And then you add 1 to that. This is 640 divided by 8. So that is 80 plus 1. 81. So there are 81 terms in this in this arithmetic sequence. All right. So this is a the first part we have done is to tell you how to count the number of terms in an arithmetic sequence. There is a little formula for it. Okay, we are going to move on to something quite different now, where we this kind of situation occur, uh, occurs quite often uh, so let's have a look at the next problem which we'd like to share with you right if there are three roads from town A to town B So if there are three roads from town A to town B, and four roads from town B to town C, in how many ways can a traveler reach C from A if he travels by road? Let's unpack this question. What is it saying? It says you've got, you've got three towns, it seems A, B, and C, and you have from town A, let's put a little dot here to show the towns, A, B, and C. Right. So there are three roads from A to B. Let's just indicate those roads like this. Okay, so there are three roads from A to B. And there are four roads from B to C. So let's construct those roads like the way we did from A to B. So you have four roads going from B to C. And the question is, in how many ways can a traveler reach C if he travels by road? So you can travel, you can use any road here and any road here to get to see. There are quite a few pathways you can take. You see? There are quite a few. The question is, how many can you take? All right. Now, the way to do this, and this is how you do this in many problems, is what you do is you take any one particular path. Let's suppose a fix my path. On that one, the first, the top path. And I say, let's choose this path. If I choose that path, then how many roads do I have for this first path? All right, you can take that and then up that way, that, the next one, that, the third one, the fourth one. So with this path, there are four. For this road, there are four different ways in which you can get to see. All right. Okay, now we've finished with this first one. And now we can ask ourselves, suppose you, you try that one. Well, obviously, it's exactly the same kind of a problem. And even for that one, there will be it's the same kind of a problem. So in each of those cases, you will have four ways. And that's the answer. The answer is, 
12, but notice it is 3 times 4. This is equal to 3 times, it's equal to 3 times 4. Now, the logic is that the first path can be chosen in three ways. The first path can be chosen in three ways. And for each of the first choices, you've got four ways of doing the next road. So, there are three ways in which you can choose the first road and for each of those choices you've got four roads for the second road and that's why we say the answer is three times four right okay now this is a very important principle see uh, and we're going to see in the next example how this thing works uh, the same kind of a principle to work out the next one. So let me just move this thing down. And we have a slightly different problem here. How many two letter words can be made using the letters of the alphabet if repetitions are not allowed? How many two-lettered words can be made using the letters of the alphabet if repetitions are not allowed? Now let's try to understand what this thing says. By word, we've got words in inverted commas, which means that these two letters don't really have to mean anything. Like for instance now, this is a two-letter word, so-called word. Right? And TW is another word. Okay, so these are examples of such words. But notice that XF is different from FX. This is a different word from that. And also that repetitions are not allowed. So you're not allowed to use DD for instance. Okay. So the argument is the same as what we did before. And I'm going to put it in a small diagram like this and what we're going to do is draw a box which has got two cells in it and we're going to say how many choices do you have for the first letter if I'm going to create all these words what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the first letter as we did before what we can do is um, sorry sorry just one moment please Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just get to the slide this thing down so that we have some space here. Um, let's just move this little diagram up. Okay, now the first letter can be chosen. Suppose I choose the first letter as A. First letter. Sorry. Suppose the first letter is chosen to be A. Then the second letter can be chosen. The repetitions are not allowed. It could be B, C, all the way up to Z. 
So there are, you have 26 letters of the alphabet. The first one is missing here. So there are 25 words which begin with A. Right. And if you try B, you'll have the same story. You're not allowed to put B, so you go to C and D, and you go all the way up to Z. And again, there are another 25 here. That's for A and B. And if you keep doing this all the way up to Z, you'll be adding 25 to itself 26 times because A, B, C, D, there are 26 choices for that. So this is actually 26 times 25. All right, now the logical argument is as follows. What we say is that we draw a box like this. We can say the first letter can be chosen in 26 ways as we saw a can be chosen in 20 a b c d up to z right but now having chosen the first letter the second letter you're not allowed to choose the first letter so here it can be chosen in 25 ways so for each choice of the first as we saw there are 25 choices for the second and therefore both letters can be chosen in 26 times 25 years. And if you multiply those two things out, you get 650. So the answer to the question is, there are 652 little words that can be chosen, that can be made. All right, but this principle here is very important because now we can state this thing formally as like this. <laughs> and we call this the first counting principle. All right, so I'm going to formalize what we said. Yeah, formalize means to put it in a general way. What, what did we do? Right. So, we say, suppose there are M ways of doing one thing. Now, this one thing, for instance, is choosing the first road and the, or choosing the first letter. Suppose there are M ways of doing one thing and N ways of doing another after the first has been done. So, in the roads case, after the first road was chosen, there were four ways of choosing the second road. Right? In that case, N was 4. And, and as far as the words were concerned, after the first letter was chosen, there were 25 ways of choosing the second one. Right? And then we say, then, assuming no other restrictions, there are M, N ways of doing both things together. You multiply the two. As we saw, we saw 3 times 4, and we saw 26 times 25. And those were the answers to those two problems. So this is put in a general con in a context and it's called the first counting principle. It's a very important principle. This number here, 3.3.1, refers to the section in my book called 1000 Olympiad Problems. And I've taken this entire talk from that book. So this is the number in that book. If you want, you can go and reference it and you can read much more on the subject that I'm going to tell you when you get to that section. All right, now let's get on to the next thing. How many diagonals does a 30-sided polygon have? All right, now you know what a diagonal means, but 
with you, and you know what a diagonal means in the say in the case of a quadrilateral. But you can have diagonals in any polygon. Quadrilateral is an example of a polygon, and it has four sides. But the polygon need not have four sides; it could have five sides, or six sides, or any number of sides, any number you can think of. In this case, you get a thirty-sided polygon. I've got no intention of drawing this thirty-sided polygon, uh, but what I will do is try to solve the problem in the case of a smaller uh, situation, and and then try to extrapolate to see how we can solve this problem. So let's first just draw our our five-sided. Uh, let's make it five. So, so we 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 are saying that uh, consider take the simpler case take the simpler case of a polygon. that has five sides. In other words, a pentagon. And let's try to solve the problem there. And then we will see how did we do the counting and figure it out. Um, Okay, let me draw a, 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 a pentagon. sides okay that's good and now I'm going to draw the diagonals let's start with this one here now how many diagonals can I draw from I'm going to fix my vertex choose this particular vertex and I'm going to draw diagonals well, if I draw the diagonals, I can see that I'm going to have one diagonal here and another diagonal here. So there were only two diagonals shooting out from from this vertex. And you can do the same thing for each of these for each of these vertices right you can draw oops you can draw two diagonals there's another there's two there but when you come to the third one you see one is already drawn okay because that point there was linked to this one, so we need need to draw only one diagonal here. And here, both are already drawn. So, how many diagonals are there? The point here in this case is that you can say each vertex. So, we, 
we, we can say that um, from each vertex we can draw two diagonals there are five vertices so the answer would presumably be should have been five times four the, the first is that you choose the vertex the, the vertex can be chosen in five ways and for each choice of the vertex there are two diagonals that I can draw it's the first counting principle and then you would think that oh but therefore there are ten diagonals but what happened was you'll notice that each diagonal has been counted twice if I look at this diagonal here for instance take this diagonal here take that diagonal this vertex here is joined to this vertex so at this point here you counted this as part of two vertices and here you're counting this thing again as part of two vertices so each diagonal is counted twice so this is not really the answer because each diagonal is counted twice so you you have to divide this by two you have to divide this by two because you got each diagonal counted twice and that will give you the answer to the number of diagonals you have and you can you, you can see if I I can actually see what the diagonals are uh, you can put a you can put a diagonal here and a diagonal there and here maybe and here and I think that takes care of all the uh, five diagonals mm. Maybe I, I didn't do this right. So let's just get this thing again. So the diagonal we're counting is this one here. That one. Okay, so, th so that gives you your five diagonals. So we, we landed up with five times two. But the problem asked for 30, a 30 sided polygon. So what happens here? So in the case of a 30 sided polygon, how would you do this problem? It's very similar. I'm going to. Oh gosh. Okay. Uh, I'm going to. Go down the page so that I have more space. Right. If I had a 30 sided figure, what happens? I will have several vertices, and at each vertex, I'll have to draw a diagonal. You notice that in the case of 5, which said 5 times 2, the reason is that you have to eliminate three vertices. When you are drawing diagonals you can't use this vertex you can't use that one you can't use these two adjacent vertex but every other vertex you will have a diagonal coming out apologies for such a bad figure but in other words the number of vertices that you have is the number of vertices is 30 but the number of diagonals that emanate from each uh, vertex is three less. So you'll have 30 times 27. There are 27 diagonals that come out from each vertex. But then these, these are counted in pairs. So we have to divide that by two as we saw before. And then you can work that out. You know, that 400 five diagonals altogether. So that's the answer to that problem. All right. So if we proceed to the next problem,
we've got a slightly different problem here. A tick and a cross are placed in a 4x4 grid of 16 blocks. No more than one in a block. No row or column of four blocks may contain both symbols. And how many ways can this be done? All right, so uh, let's just see what we are saying. A tick and a cross are to be placed in a four by four grid. So let's just draw a four by four grid to, to kick off. And you can draw a four by four. Good. Um, so we need uh, four rows and four columns. So that's what I'm doing here. All right, now you've got 16 squares here and you want to put a tick and a cross. So let's put a tick. Once we have a tick, we're going to put a cross now. The question says you can't put a tick and a cross in the same row or in the same column, which means that these, you're not allowed to put it in any one of these rows. Uh, <clears throat> Alright, so uh, for example, see I'm not allowed uh, to <laughs> okay, I thought I knew how to do this Sorry, oh, I still can't do it. Anyway, you're not allowed to put the cross anywhere here. Uh, sorry, I'm still trying to figure these things out. Okay, so you're not allowed to put a cross wherever in the row or the column in which the tick appears. So you have to put a cross maybe here. So here. Okay. So the question is how many ways can you put a tick and a cross in this in this way? So the answer again is you the first the tick can be chosen in we saw we had open open choice. We could have chosen the tick in any one of 16 ways. Tick can be chosen, can be selected in 16 ways. But the cross is limited. The cross can be only chosen in, can be selected in. You're not allowed to use any one of these squares here. You've got four plus three, seven. So seven squares are eliminated. So you only have nine possible choices for the cross and therefore the answer from the first counting principle for each choice of the first you've got nine choices for the second there are 16 choices for the first and therefore there are 16 times 9 different ways choosing a cross and a tick. So this is another example of the first counting principle. Okay. So now if I continue to look at the next problem. Okay, we go on to the second counting principle. The second count counting principle is very much like the first counting principle. The only difference is that 
we say that we don't have to fill two boxes, but we fill you know, more than two or more boxes. So let's just read this thing. Suppose we need to fill in R boxes. If the first box can be filled in M1 ways, and the second in M2 ways, the third in M3 ways, and so on, until the R box, which can be filled in MR ways, then all the R boxes can be filled in M1 times M2 times M3 times MR ways. I, 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 I just want to um, recap here. You see, in case you, you don't understand where these boxes are coming from, in each of these cases, we could have solved these problems by using the so-called boxes method. For the roads, I could have said, the first choice can be made in three ways, and the second choice in four ways. This was the roads problem. And in the word, the two words problem, right, we could have done the same thing. Again, we could have created a box involving two symbols, but there the question was, the first letter, not road now, the first letter can be chosen in how many ways? This is the first letter. And we saw the first letter can be chosen in 26 ways. And once that was chosen, we saw we could choose the second letter in 25 ways. So this is the two word problem, two letter two letters problem. And likewise, the last problem that we did, we had, again there, we had two boxes, but there we said the first tick, the tick could, could have been chosen in 16 ways. And once the tick was chosen, the, the cross was, could be chosen in nine ways. So there, the answer here was three times four. The answer here is 26 times 25. The answer here is 16 times nine. So in this thing here, what we are saying is that we don't have two boxes. We have any number of boxes. So you fill the first one, how many ways can you do that? The second one, how many ways can you do that? And so on. And in the end, you will multiply the whole lot as we saw here. That the number of ways is where you, is the product of all these, right? Like the way we had the product of these two. Okay. All right. So it's the same as before, it's just that we don't have necessarily two boxes, we could have had any number of boxes. Okay, so let's uh, get on to see whether there are any other applications. So look at this. You are asked to pick the first, second and third athletes in a race in which there are 12 athletes, All right? So you want to pick the first, the second and the third. What is the least number of choices you have to make to ensure that you have the winning combination? So this time you have to choose the first, the second and the third. You've got 12 people, right? You've got 12 athletes all together and so on. And you want to choose, you can order them anyhow you feel like. You can take the first one, could be any one of them. The second one is also a random one and the third one is random. So, but there are 12 athletes all together. So how many ways can you choose the first, second and third? Well, it's the same as before. The first can be chosen in 12 ways because you've got the whole field to choose from. But once you've chosen the first, the first person can't come second. 
So he has to be taken out from that lot and you have 11 athletes left and you say the second person can be chosen in 11 ways and then likewise once the first two have been chosen the last the third person can be chosen in 10 ways so therefore according to the second counting principle the total number of ways choices you can make is 1320 12 times 11 is 132 so there are you have to make 132 choices right? if you put some concrete thing onto this like for instance you say somebody who is is giving bets to this to say look uh, I you, you can you can take a bet you choose your first three and pay one rand for it if you win I'll give you a hundred bucks so you say hey I can get a hundred rands for just one rand and you can buy this bet but the truth is you have to make 1320 different possibilities for you to win so the chances of winning that is one in 1320 right and this guy is walking all the way to the bank because he's only giving a hundred rands each time somebody wins they have to buy 1320 tickets and they have to spend 1320 rands to be ensured of getting that one 100 rands so gambling is not the way out okay so let's look at a, another problem create a string of 10 numbers using only zeros and ones how many such numbers can you create so again if you think about this this is the same problem that we've got but this time you want to create you need to make 10 choices this time you have to make, you have to create make 10 choices so the first one Okay, these are not very nicely <coughs> nicely drawn so let me just uh, oh right. so you got you got you got 10 boxes there and you want to fill each box with either zero or one so again if you apply the second counting principle problem becomes very easy because see the, the, a, a string a so-called string examples of string are one zero zero one one zero zero one let's see what you got eight here yeah? and one zero so that's a string there are ten numbers using only zeros and ones so this is an example of such a string and then you could have You can have various kinds of numbers like this and the question is how many such numbers can you create and the answer is well the first one can be chosen in two ways either one or zero the second one is also two ways in fact you can only have say one or zero for each of these and then the number of numbers you can create is you have to multiply all these things out according to the second countable counting principle Two times two times two. But well, there are ten of them. So it's two to the power of ten. Okay, and if you care to actually find out what that is, it works out to be 1024. So there are 1024 such numbers. It's quite a lot. You might think there are not so many because you're only using zeros and ones. But when you calculate this, you will see 
that you have to make 10 choices, you see, and each choice can be made in two different ways. So, that's the answer to that problem. Here's another one. How many five digit numbers greater than 60,000 are odd? All right, now you're looking for five digit numbers. You have to create five digit numbers. So you have to choose five, a number which has got five digits in it. So let's draw five boxes. You want to choose a five digit number greater than 60,000 and it must be odd. Now, let's look at some of, some of these examples. Uh, it must be greater than 60,000. So, say 67,841. It must be odd. Now, this is not allowed because this is not greater than 60,000. And likewise, you, you could have had. This is greater than 60,000, but it's not odd. So this is not allowed as well. So you are looking for five digit numbers. You have to choose the first digit, the second digit, the third digit, the fourth digit, and the fifth digit. And each choice, you, you put it in here. And finally, you multiply the whole lot. So the first choice, right, will be what? You want a five digit number. So this first number can be chosen first number it could be any one of six seven eight nine that's all there are four possibilities for this first choice so I can put down four here there are only four ways in which you can choose the first digit so having chosen the first digit how many ways can you choose the second one now the second one is random you can you could use any one of these digits the second digit could be uh, you know, 40,000 or 49,000. Oh, not 40. You can start with 7, 0, or 8, 9, or 6, 2. So the second digit can be chosen from any one of 0, 1, 2. It's a digit. All the way up to 9. And there are 10 choices yeah and likewise the second choice can be done in 10 ways and likewise the third one can be done also in 10 ways because these numbers can be random but here one has to be careful because you have to make this thing an odd number so the only way you can fill in the last box is to use oh, I'm sorry um, one three five seven and nine you can't use even numbers here. You want to want that number to be odd. So there are only five choices for the last one. See? Five choices for this last one. So the number of numbers you that you have is according to the second counting principle. You have to multiply all these. He said M1 times M2 times so on. So the five numbers you multiply, and this is easy, four times five is 20, and you got 20,000. So there are 20,000 numbers, which are odd, which are greater than 60,000, and having nine digits. You can, you can kind of guess that, because you're going up to 100,000, so there are about 40,000 in between and half of them should be odd and half of them should be even. So it actually turns out that there are exactly 20,000 uh, odd numbers. But the problem here is that if you count the number of even numbers, it is not 20,000. The number of even numbers is actually one less than 20,000. So you could have done it that way. 
and it because it's much more demanding on uh, on our faculties to try to work it out in this particular way okay so the answer to this question is 20000 let's go on to the next problem The supermarket stocks four kinds of bread, five kinds of meat, and three kinds of cheese. I, I'm not going to go through this thing here. Uh, oh no! Wait a minute. I will go through this thing. It's not as easy as it looks. Okay. So you got four kinds of bread. Let's keep track of that. So the number of types of bread you have. You have three choices for the bread, for the meat, you had five choices I think, I don't know why I have a problem, let's just get to that. Yes. So there are five kinds of meat. So let's just get the meat here in order. There are five of them, and then there are three, uh, four. Sorry, four kinds of cheese. So you have different types of sandwiches. Let's just understand this question first. So the, the, the supermarket sells different types of sandwiches. So, so you could have the bread and the meat combination. You can have the bread and the cheese combination. Or you can have bread with both meat and cheese. The question is how many different types do you have? All right. In all the cases, you need, you need to have bread. In all the cases, you need to have bread. So let's take the first case where you've only got bread. And what did we say? Um, Frustrating. Uh, I have to learn how to. Okay, so in all the cases, you've got bread, and the first one you got bread and meat, the second one you got bread and cheese. And you got the third one, you got both meat, bread, meat, and cheese. So you will have, in the first case, we will have a, you only have two choices bread and meat, uh, meat. So let's draw a box with two, two choices. You got bread, you choose your bread, there are three ways of choosing the bread, and there are five ways of choosing the meat. So this is the bread meat combination. Bread meat. There are three choices here. And as far as the bread cheese combination is concerned, you have a similar situation. You still have bread. This time you have cheese. Still three choices for your bread. but you have four choices for the cheese. So if you have a bread cheese combination, that is the scenario for that. And as far as the bread, meat and cheese are concerned, we have three different choices there. You have to choose your bread, you have to choose your meat and the cheese. So in this case, you've got three boxes because you have to choose all three 
Bread can still be chosen in three ways. The meat can be chosen in five ways, and the cheese in four ways. So this is your bread, meat, and cheese combination. So this this combination, the three times five types of bread meat combinations, and the twelve types of bread cheese combinations, and here you multiply these, and you get sixty three times five times four. And therefore, the total number of possibilities is that. Um, sorry, it seems I, I think there were four kinds of bread. Sorry, we had four kinds of bread. And I was using three here. All right, it should have been, it should have been, bread was supposed to be really four. And um, uh, well, let me do that. I'm sorry about this. I I stop here. So you, so you need four, four of that, four there, four there. So the four types of bread. But I think the cheese was three. You didn't have four, five, and three, but you had. Sorry, there were four choices for the bread, three choices for the cheese. So therefore, um, I should have had four here. So this is four times five. This is four times three. And here you have four times five times three. Okay. Sorry, I messed up there. All right. Then, uh, then you will see that you still have twelve here, but this is twenty. Four times five is twenty, so that gives you ninety-two. All right, here you have to add those three numbers because you can see once you finish with the bread and meat, you say okay, there are so many like that, and for the bread and cheese, there's so many like that, and for the last combination, there's so many like that. All together, you have to add these numbers. See, you don't multiply them. And I think that should be quite clear. Okay, now let me just see if there's anything more here. I think uh, we, can, we, we, we can stop here. Uh, I'm sure I've exceeded my time considerably. Um, so this is the, this will be the first of uh, lessons, maybe three lessons on counting. And what we have done today, just to sum up, is to speak about the first and the second counting principles. And we have showed by means of several examples how these two principles can be applied to count uh, certain, you know, to, to solve certain problems regarding counting in the real world. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening. And then please remember to tune in to the next lesson which will be some tips on counting part two enjoy the rest of your day bye